to have to leave this room about one o'clock, and so there's not going to be a lot of time for questions. If you do have questions, um, here are some places you can ask uh, Pat Kitcher questions. Uh, after the talk outside, uh, after lunch, uh, she's going to be on the fourth floor of Ross Hall around the philosophy department, probably around 3 to 4 o'clock if you want to ask her questions. Um, from 4.15 to 6 o'clock, Pat's going to be at Da Vinci's um, with the philosophy club, and there's a reception for Pat Kitcher tonight at uh, 817 Kellogg, for those of you interested in asking any questions. Uh, Patricia Kitcher is currently a full professor of philosophy at the University of California at San Diego. She has uh, held various positions at uh, the University of Vermont, University of Michigan, uh, MIT, and Minnesota. She has written important articles in philosophy of psychology, history of philosophy, and various other fields. Um, she completed in 1990 a book called Kant's Transcendental Psychology. And uh, she has a book that's just recently come out uh, with MIT Press called Freud's Dream, A Complete Interdisciplinary Science of Mind. Um, please welcome uh, Patricia Kitcher. She's going to talk to us today about, um, let's see, what is it? Um, Freud's Interdisciplinary Fiasco. <laughs> Um, I haven't been able to find the microphone, so please let me know if you can't hear me up at the top. But let me just, before I start reading at you, um, tell you what I want to try to do. Uh, I don't know how many of you have views about Freud, um, and I don't know how many of you have views about my other topic, which is interdisciplinary cognitive science. But let me just say a little bit about the relation between these two, and then I'll get on to the paper. Many, many universities have come around to the view that all of the mental sciences ought to be treated together. And so what you ought to have are interdisciplinary programs. And in some places, for example, at the University of California, San Diego, actually an interdisciplinary department of cognitive science where you bring together all of the different sciences that relate to mental things. So you bring together brain physiology and psychology and anthropology and philosophy of psychology, which has been concerned with traditional questions about the nature of the mind. And you put all these people together and let them learn from each other. And that is the way we are at last going to make some progress on trying to understand this very difficult and complex thing, the human mind. Almost everybody has supported this view that the way to really conquer the mind is for all the disciplines to get together and work together and share information so that we can understand the mind in terms of its implications for philosophy, in terms of its social relations. We can understand it psychologically. We can understand it physiologically. I agree with this idea that we ought to sort of get together and study the mind from all these different aspects. But what my paper is about is some of the dangers of an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, as I said, I don't know how aware you are of all this, but an interdisciplinary approach these days is, for example, a great way to get a grant. All you have to do is put interdisciplinary on your grant application, and Washington will throw money at you because everybody is convinced that this is the way to go. I, too, think it is the way to go, but I think there are a lot of dangers of doing things this way. And what I try to do is use Freud as a historical example so that we can look back and see when this same thing was attempted before. Because what I will argue is that Freud, too, tried to put all of these things together. He tried to use biological knowledge, anthropological knowledge, psychiatric knowledge, put all this together and, com and come up with a sort of complete theory of human mentality. The Freud I will present to you is very different from the Freud you were probably used to. I'm not going to talk about dreams. I am going to talk about sex, but you'll see I'm going to talk about sex in such a way that it presents sex as a sort of theoretical matter that Freud was certainly not a dirty old man worried about sex. He was worried about sex 
for highly theoretical reasons. And I want to try to show you sort of the structure of his theory, how all these different disciplines work together to present really a very strong theory. It's not for nothing that Freudianism was one of the dominant theories of the 20th century. It was a very good theory that drew strength from many different areas. So I'm going to try to present the interdisciplinary foundations of psychoanalysis as, first of all, what made the theory good. But then in the second half of my paper, I'm going to suggest that this particular interdisciplinary approach that Freud used was actually the source of his downfall. This is why this is supposed to have some lessons for the way we do interdisciplinary theories today that because Freud's theory was interdisciplinary, he got into all sorts of problems with it. Okay, so the, the paper really has two points. One, to present a reinterpretation of Freud. I think it's a sympathetic interpretation of Freud, although I'll end up arguing that Freud's theory really is defunct at this point because the theories on which he built it collapsed. Uh, but the second point, is just to stand back and look at what happens when you try to integrate work from lots of different areas. What are some of the dangers that are involved? So, does everyone sort of understand what I'm going to try to do? OK. Let me get started with it, because we haven't got a lot of time. Most of Freud's contemporary critics and admirers share a common picture of the evidential structure of psychoanalysis. The support for this theory came from dream and patient data. Freud developed his theories by trying to understand and relieve neurotic symptoms, so neuroses were a sort of foundation, and by interpreting his own and patient dreams. Further, the general consensus is, insofar as his theories could be confirmed, could be established, the confirmation came in the form of cures of neuroses and insights into the otherwise unintelligible material of dreams. This interpretive consensus is hardly surprising. Freud flaunted this picture that he just took it from the patients and just took it from the dreams, uh, his sort of empiricist view of theory construction, about as often as George Bush pays homage to the principles of conservatism and with exactly the same level of commitment. Bush is a pragmatist and a conciliator, but he believes that he ought to be a conservative and so declares that he holds the true faith. Freud was a speculative theorist and a master system builder, as I will argue, but he believed that scientific theories ought to be simply a matter of inference from the data. So he claimed preposterously, I think, that the whole edifice of psychoanalysis was simply built on what he'd learned from his patients. The truth is almost exactly the opposite. Freud did not develop his doctrines from the couch or the bed. He constructed psychoanalysis by synthesizing a large number of diverse but fundamentally compatible theories from different biological and social sciences in a simple, coherent, and comprehensive account of mental life. This was why his theory was so successful because it held out the promise of a unified theory of mentality, one that ranged from the highest intellectual attainments, including art, socialization and morality, social organization and morality, to the most bizarre phenomena of dreaming and madness, all grounded in an apparently firm biological foundation. If Freud's bold synthesis of 19th century social and biological science was the secret of his success, it was also a major cause of his spectacular failure. Now, given current efforts to construct interdisciplinary theories in cognitive science, the time seems apt for examining this first attempt to integrate the mental and the biological sciences. We can learn from Freud's mistakes because although some of them were foolish, a number were subtle and are much easier to spot with the advantage of hindsight. I have two goals in this talk. First, I will briefly explain how psychoanalysis integrated results and approaches from different disciplines in order to convince you that this really was an instance of interdisciplinary theory construction. He built it out of all these different pieces. 
Then I will take up three of Freud's more instructive and costly errors. Actually, given the time, I may have to cut that to two. Um, in each case, I will try to present examples of contemporary work in cognitive science where these contemporary theorists appear to be following in Freud's missteps. Um, I'm going to take a couple of examples from different schools within cognitive science, but then the main example I want to use at the end is a fault in interdisciplinary reasoning that I think actually encompasses everybody in the interdisciplinary cognitive science community. All right, let me just talk about how psychoanalysis was put together out of different disciplines. Freud developed the major hypotheses of psychoanalysis by integrating results and approaches of at least eight different fields. This eight. I am not going to talk about all of these. What I'm going to do is just present a couple of relevant results from some of these fields simply to illustrate how Freud incorporated and related work in various disciplines in a general theory of the development and functioning of mental life. From neuroanatomy and neurophysiology, he borrowed two discoveries. During the 1890s, it became apparent that the nervous system was made up of discrete neurons, which pass some form of electrical or chemical energy among them. Second, he also borrowed from neurophysiology the idea that neural matter was reflexive. You know, reflexive means energy comes in, it runs around in it, and then it has to get discharged in some sort of motor activity. Okay, so from neurophysiology, I borrowed those two, I'll get to psychology in a second. All right, so he borrowed the idea that neurons were discrete and that neural matter just acted as a reflex. Freud also adopted two leading methodological assumptions from psychology. The first will be probably familiar to a lot of you, associationism. This is the view that many mental phenomena can be explained by appeal to associations formed between ideas when they are experienced together. So the idea is that if you experience two ideas together, then they will be somehow cemented together in your mind. And associationism has been a very standard principle of explanation in psychology for several hundred years. But there was also a second and very different psychological approach that he used. And this was that the best way to understand this very complicated mental apparatus was to decompose it into separate functional units. These units didn't necessarily have any particular location in the brain, but you wanted to talk about a unit, for example, that dealt with speech, a unit that dealt with comprehension, and so forth. So this idea was that you decompose um, the, the brain into functional, sorry, the mind into functional units, and you didn't claim necessarily that these had a specific biological location, though you certainly hoped eventually you could find that. By the way, that's exactly the status that Freud claimed for the ego, the id, and the superego. These were functional divisions. Who knew exactly where they were in the brain? Might not be able to say. Let me now turn to psychiatry. Freud was, of course, a practicing psychiatrist. And psychiatry contributed three crucial hypotheses to psychoanalysis. Most importantly, the view that neurotic behavior could be the product of ideas of which the subject was unaware. Freud was not the first person to say this. Many psychiatrists believed that what was wrong with neurotics was that they were bugged by unconscious ideas. Besides making a connection between neuroses and unconscious ideas, many psychiatrists believed that disorders such as hysteria had a sexual origin. Of course, hysteria comes from the womb, right? And there's no secret about the link between hysteria and sexuality. Finally, there was work on aphasia. Do you all know what aphasia is? It's sort of inability to speak uh, caused by, by mental reasons. Um, and work on aphasia, some of which, by the way, Freud did himself, implied that ideas were represented in the brain in a complex way. Let me show you how this works. All right. So this is what he gets from neurology and psychology. What he gets from psychiatry is that you can have unconscious ideas and many neuroses are sexual. And then he got this picture of aphasia that when you're representing an idea in your mind or brain, whatever you want to call it, 
You've got properties of the animal, okay, its shape and so forth, but then you've also got properties of the word. After all, if you can recognize the word and pronounce it, then you have to store this sort of information somewhere. Now, what aphasia studies showed was that the sort of idea and the word representing it, this link could be severed. Some patients had the idea left, but not the word. Some people had the word left, but not the idea. Okay? And this turns out to be critical in Freud's theory of how we have unconscious ideas. Let me now turn to a much less familiar science, and one that you're not going to be able to take seriously because you think this just occurs these days in Cosmopolitan magazine, but this was the science of sexology, which was a serious science in the 19th century. Um, at the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th, many gifted naturalists and theoreticians made a very serious effort to fathom the varieties and foundations of sexual behavior. By the way, as far as I know, the descriptions of sort of, as it's called in those days, sexual deviation stuff has never been rejected. I mean, this is very good scientific work. Freud borrowed an enormous amount from these guys and never acknowledged it, which is why Freud is thought to be the guy who introduced sex into psychiatry. That's not true at all. He borrowed from people like Kraft Ebbing and Havelock Ellis and, and just didn't say so. Um, I want to, and, and they had done a vast amount of work on sexuality. I want to mention just three contributions of the sexologist, and you'll recognize these as Freudian, okay? But they aren't Freudian, they come from these other guys. The discovery of infantile sexuality. This was quite a broadly accepted hypothesis. There was also the view of that there were stages of sexual development. This was, again, widely held. It wasn't just Freud's idea. Finally, there was this idea that there was no one sexual instinct. Rather, what you had was um, what was called component instincts. So I keep in mind this is the time of Darwin. The idea was that we descended from earlier human beings and also from animals, and that we get some of our instincts from the animals. And so, um, just to give you one example, the idea was you could explain some odd sexual practices by noting that in animals, from whom we get all these instincts, that uh, sex is sometimes followed by cannibalism. And this was supposed to explain some of the, the odd sexual things that were viewed, OK? So you had this notion of component instincts. And then there was supposed to be all a happy ending, because right, you've got all these really odd components going on in you. But miraculously, through maturation and social conditioning, all of this works out, and they all kind of get knitted together into um, standard adult heterosexual behavior. That's when everything goes correctly. Okay, so it's come out like this. All right, let me now turn to anthropology and sociology just very briefly. Anthropology's contribution to psychoanalysis was not any particular result, but a sort of research program, something that they thought was very important. 19th century anthropologists assumed that the human mind could be adequately understood only by going back to the minds of primitive ancestors and tracing lines of development. Now, how are you going to get back to the minds of ancient ancestors? Well, you're going to do this by studying artifacts of old civilizations, also contemporary savages, that is, people who were outside the loop of Western culture, and children. All right, why did you study so-called savages. Um, the idea was that since they were outside of Western culture, they'd actually be very like the first humans. So they'd tell you what primitive humans were like. Why did you study children? Because everybody at this time was a recapitulationist. You know what recapitulationism is? It says that ontogeny is the rapid recapitulation of phylogeny. Just in case that didn't make any sense to you, what that means is as a child is growing up, that's what ontogeny is, he or she goes through all the stages that the whole human race went through through history. That's phylogeny. So ontogeny, each individual lifetime, recapitulates phylogeny, the lifetime of the human race. And so the idea is if you look at kids, you can find out what primitive people were like. Having two sons, I think there's actually more to this theory than people say anymore. But anyway, uh, this was why children were so important. All right, the final major contributor to psychoanalytic theory I will discuss is evolutionary biology. Right, so from anthropology, we get 
this. Uh, evolutionary biology is everywhere. One of the reasons that it was so important in the developments of Freud's thought was that it contributed to everything else. Um, evolutionary thinking was what led psychologists to look at four <coughs> different stages of development. It's what led anthropologists. By the way, 19th century anthropology has always been called, since the 19th century, evolutionary anthropology, because it was so convinced that the only way to understand people is to go back to the origins and see how it all happened. I should say sociology also adopted the evolutionary mode of explanation. To account for some fancy social behavior, you trace that back to its origin, allegedly. So something like religion, you tried to trace that back to how primitive humans came to have religious beliefs. And eventually, you wanted to try to trace that all back to animals. There was sort of some funny genealogies of morality and religion produced as a result of this, but this was a standard intellectual project. The theory of evolution also entered psychoanalysis directly. Freud believed that although other theorists might posit instincts at will, you could just kind of talk about this instinct or that instinct, that evolutionary biology really only sanctioned two, self-preservative and sexual instincts. That's what he gets out of Darwin, that there are really two instincts, um, self-preservation and sex, and that's why he's always got two forces going in his theory. Besides that, he was a committed recapitulationist to the end of his life, even after the theory was gone, and a committed Lamarckian. Do you know what Lamarckianism is? It's the idea that acquired characteristics can be inherited. You probably heard about Lamarck as the villain in the debate between Darwin and Lamarck, right, about the giraffes who keep stretching, right, and then they somehow, all that stretching during their lifetime allowed their, their kids, to, their little giraffes, to have bigger necks, longer necks. Um, and Freud accepted all of this. All right, what I now want to do is try to illustrate how Freud actually constructed his theories by putting all this stuff together, by drawing connections among these various results and approaches. One of the most attractive features of psychoanalysis was its apparently firm biological foundations. Freud assumed that neural ma matter functioned as a reflex. Now, you all remember what a reflex is, right? Energy comes in, it goes whirring around, and out it goes through some kind of motor discharge. But notice, on the reflex model of the neural system, you need something to supply the juice. Where are you getting the stimulus that is then activating the mind and then getting discharged? Right, so you require energy, either externally or internally, to propel the system. Now, his second biological uh, assumption was that the internal sources of the energy to drive the nervous system were either self-preservative or sexual instincts and largely sexual. The problem is that the self-preservative instincts don't do anything interesting. They just leave you to behave normally, OK? So the ones he focused on were the sexual instincts. All right, hence you get libido theory. Libido theory is simply the claim that the neural system was partly driven and largely influenced by instinctual sexual drives. Now, notice that this theory did not simply borrow results from neurophysiology and evolutionary biology. It showed how seemingly distinct and well-established facts could be related in an elegant and simple story. A reflexive nervous system needed sources of energy. Sexual selection was a crucial force in evolution. You needed sex in evolution. All psychological forces had to have a physiological basis. So Freud reasoned that gonads and other internal organs secreted a substance into the nervous system, libido, that both provided the nervous energy and constituted the physiological mechanism by which sexuality influenced behavior and so ultimately the course of evolution. So he puts this together in a way that really works. Now let me turn to Freud's central so-called clinical hypothesis, which was that neurotic behavior was caused by unconscious ideas with sexual content. What I want to argue about this as well, he didn't get this by looking at patients. He got this because everybody was saying the same thing. All the different sciences were pointing towards this. 
All right, now, as already noted, psychiatry had actually suggested both halves of these, of this thing. That is, it had linked neuroses with unconscious ideas and it had linked neuroses with sex, okay? So he gets this out of psychiatry, but then he actually can increase the plausibility of it by drawing on other sciences. So this is how the aphasia work sort of influences and led him to a, a much more elegant theory. Freud assumed that in order for something to become conscious, it had to be associated with speech. But now aphasia had told you that words could be cut off, that, that, the, that the word part of an idea could be simply cut off from the idea. It would lose, the idea would lose its word representation. So he appealed to aphasia to actually explain how ideas could become unconscious. Then he appealed to sexology, which had pointed out that sex was not just forbidden in deed, it was forbidden in thought and word as well. He puts these two things together and says, look, sexology tells us that what's going to be repressed are sexual ideas. Aphasia can explain how ideas can actually become unconscious because they get cut off from their word representation. Hence, he appeals to these two things to give theoretical support to this basic idea he gets from psychiatry. He then goes on and uses associationism and reflexes to actually explain how this unconscious sexual idea is going to produce a neurotic symptom. He borrows associationism, right? Simply this idea that um, two things which you experience together get linked up. Then he borrows the reflex hypothesis, right? Energy comes in and it's got to go someplace. But if, you, if the word is, if the idea is unconscious, it can't issue in a word, which is also a motor activity. Right, you say the word, it just gets bottled up in there. So by drawing on all of these things, he could offer a very elegant account of why this was true. Let me show you this in one simple example. In the Dora case history, he explained why Dora had a sort of hysterical cough. Like she coughed all the time. She's always clearing her throat. He said, all right, I can explain this. What happened was, once when she was out walking, she experienced a sexual trauma at the time when she was very short of breath and coughing. What happens is that then set up an association. All right, whenever she then has a sexual idea and libido is flowing into the system, the idea cannot result in behavior or speech because it's kind of cut off, okay? And now you've got this energy sitting there in the system. What's it gonna do? Well, it flows to the associated idea of coughing. She then coughs, and that discharges the energy. This is not wild speculation about why he thinks the symptoms are linked to the disease. He actually has a very elegant mechanical story of why that should be true. So what I'm trying to suggest is even the so-called clinical hypotheses he actually has a, a very theoretical story to tell. And the way to understand this is that he just puts all this stuff together. All right, let me just skip ahead here a little bit. The idea that neurotic behavior was caused by unconscious ideas with sexual content may have entered psychiatry as a sort of humble <coughs> clinical hypothesis, but by the time Freud gets through with it, You've got this elaborate theory of how all this is actually working. And the point I really wanted to make with all this is he doesn't just grab stuff willy-nilly from different theories. He shows how all of this can be integrated and so try to produce a coherent and complete theory of the causes of abnormal and normal mental processing. Now, I want to try to give some account of what his global theory looked like, how all of this comes out in a total theory. And to do this, I want to end this sort of first part of my talk uh, by taking up the oldest question about psychoanalysis, why sex? Why is sex at the center of this? We've already actually considered a major reason. The elegant fit between the needs of a reflexive nervous system and the idea that there are sexual instincts, which was offered by evolutionary biology. Beyond psychiatry and evolutionary biology, 
anthropology, and sociology also testified to the importance of sex in human life. Both assumed that marriage was the central social institution, and as one well-known sociologist put it, marriage itself is rooted in the family, or dropping the euphemism, marriage is rooted in sex. All right, so you've got marriage as a pivotal social institution, but marriage itself depends on sex, so all of your explanations of social phenomena are going to try to tie back to this. Further, sexual factors convincingly met the methodological standard of the 19th century social sciences, which was any explanation you had of these kind of fancy mental achievements had to be tied back down to something that we, were, we shared with animals. And sex was the obvious um, sort of idea in that. Finally, Freud was led to see the advantages of sexual theories by work in sexology itself. Like many 19th century theorists, sexologists debated whether sexual behavior was a matter of heredity or environment. Oh, everybody talked about this. Is it just heredity or is it the environment? But Freud did not choose sides in this. Rather, he synthesized the best work in both traditions, those who claimed it was heredity, those who claimed it was environment. As a result, he accumulated a huge body of material relating sex to an impressive variety of human conditions. When he considered this material in light of the ideas of evolutionary biology, psychiatry, sociology, and anthropology just considered, he reached his grand unifying theory of human mentality. All mental phenomena, from dreams and madness to religion, art, and social mores, could be understood as the expression of sexual instincts as modified by human history on the one hand, and we've changed and passed all these things on, and individual heredity and environment on the other. So absolutely everything is going to be explained by going back to sex. However, Freud did not, how did he get there? He did not get to this theory by extrapolating from his patient's sexual difficulties to a pervasive role for sexuality in human life. He focused on the sexual aspects of his patient's lives and dreams because many different sciences had stressed the importance of sex. Sex became the keystone of psychoanalysis. Let me just show you how I think this all sort of fitted together. And you've got sex right at the middle here. Here's psychoanalysis. Why sex is right at the middle is that sex is going to make the link between physiology. You've actually got libido flowing into the system and all the mental sciences. Okay, philology here is just linguistics. He actually tries to relate all of these things back and forth. Okay, so sex is at the center because this was the most promising bridge between the biological and the mental sciences, and Freud yearned for what he called metaphysical knowledge, that is a complete understanding of human mentality from its biological basis to these, these most abstract things about art and morality. All right, so this is what Freud's picture looked like. Besides illustrating the interdisciplinary character of psychoanalysis, I hope that this diagram and the preceding discussion also provide some sense of why Freud believed he was on the threshold of a major advance. You know, all of Freud's critics complain that this guy was an egomaniac. He just believed he was right. He had to be right, and he never could face the idea that he was wrong. Well, you know, if you've got this many different sciences agreeing with you, uh, we might all think we were right. And if he could show how they all fit together in a sort of unified picture, uh, it is enough to make you think that you are right. Um, I, but this is why he believed that he, he was going to be right. And it was, we were finally going to get a theory of human mentality. By forging connections among recent developments in the various relevant sciences, psychoanalysis opened up the possibility of a systematic theory of mentality that did away with scientifically dubious distinctions between mind and body, humans and other animals. All right, so far I've talked about the positive role of interdisciplinary thinking in Freud's theory. I now want to turn to the darker side of the story, the mistakes that have helped to make psychoanalysis the sort of textbook case for philosophy of science of a pseudoscience. I'm going to start with the biological foundations. 
l let me just tell the story briefly. Look, the problem is everything goes wrong, okay? He's got libido theory, and so he's waiting for endocrinologists to find libido. Where is it? And he waits, and he waits, and what endocrinologists, people who study hormonal systems, tell him is hormones don't work that way. They do not supply energy to the body. They do not supply it to the nervous system. He kind of ignores this, but the mistake I want to talk about is that he ignores developments in neurophysiology. Freud had developed this reflex model of the mind by extrapolating. Each little neuron, according to neurophysiology, took on energy and discharged it to the next neuron. He extrapolated from that picture to the entire nervous system. The nervous system took on energy, and then it had to get rid of it, OK? This picture turned out to be wrong, and he was told it was wrong. In 1906, a very famous physiologist called Charles Sherrington published a book called The Integrative Action of the Nervous System. In this book, what he argued was, well, you may have thought 19th century physiology got us a very long way, but it didn't solve any of the hard problems. Fine, we got reflexes. What we want to understand is how all these little reflexes get integrated into smooth physical and mental behavior. What you had to understand was not the individual reflexes, but how they were integrated, as the title of the book suggests. In other words, what Sherrington was saying to Freud was, look, you think you can just go from the reflex character of an individual neuron to the reflex character of the whole mental system, but you can't. One of the hardest problems facing neurophysiology today is to try to understand how, starting with reflexes, we actually get integrated action. Freud simply ignored this warning. And what happened was, in the next 20 years, people simply, they didn't really abandon reflexes, but they took on a fundamentally different approach to the nervous system. And by 1930, it was clear that Freud's basic assumption, the nervous system could only function by having something flow into it, was wrong. That in fact, the nervous system had its own sources of energy. It didn't have to sit around waiting for libido to drive it. Now, what I want you to realize is that this was a disaster. Um, it, it led him to all sorts of problems. Look, Freud's central explanations was the existence of dreams and for neuroses. Why did we dream? Well, because all this libido stuff was coming into the nervous system, causing an overload of energy. And at night, when your ego wasn't on guard, this energy just kind of went wild around the brain, OK, and led you to have all sorts of dreams. Why was it neurotics had tics and paralyses? Well, libido's dumping all this stuff into the nervous system. The ideas are unconscious, so you can't talk about them. You don't act. You've got all this excess nervous energy in there, and that's what leads to paralysis, final motor discharge, or leads to neurotic symptoms. Now, if the nervous system doesn't get this stuff from the outside, then it hasn't got to discharge it. What I want you to realize is once the reflex model of the nervous system was questioned, his central theories fell apart because you, his explanation of dreams and madness, which were you know, his two star cases of what he could explain, traded on the idea that the nervous system was burdened by all this extra energy coming in. But if the nervous system doesn't work that way, if it's just got its own energy and just goes along, then he's got no explanation for dreams or madness, and he is in bad shape. He cannot explain the two things he claimed he could explain. All right, now Freud continued to do this. What I want to suggest is that these very same mistakes are going on today. I'm not going to talk in detail about this example, but what I want you to, to show you is that what's going on in this example of Freud taking this very seriously is that what he is doing, and this is an endemic problem, in interdisciplinary research is that he's got more faith that neurophysiology is just going to go on like it did in 1890 and keep going and it's all going to work out. He's got more faith than the experts. Sherrington is telling him, look, you know, 
there are really a lot of problems here. Yes, we found reflexes, but we, the whole system can't possibly operate that way. Freud just happily goes on believing this. One of the major problems, I think, for any interdisciplinary research program is that you borrow results from somebody else, and then you're sure that those guys are going to keep going with that program and get it right. And they don't always. They shift courses, and then you're left high and dry. Right? You've assumed that this is all going to work out. You go on assuming this. If problems come up, you just say, oh, well, that's just a little technical problem. It'll all work out someday. I'm not going to worry about it. But it doesn't. And so I think this is really a very, very serious problem in any kind of interdisciplinary theory construction. It's just too easy to have more faith that another discipline that's not your home discipline is going to get it right. That whatever little problems there are in physiology, they'll all just be worked out. And that just doesn't happen. And I think this was a mistake that Freud made, and I think it's a mistake that others have made. Uh, because of the shortness of time, I want to skip another mistake that I think is another problem and get to what I think is the worst problem for interdisciplinary theory construction and indeed the worst problem that Freud ran into. Um, because I think this is sort of the most important lesson for interdisciplinary theory construction that I want to draw. This is Freud's most pervasive error and this is what led to the real disaster, I think. As Freud was coming to intellectual maturity, a number of diverse sciences agreed on what an ideal theory of the human mind or brain should look like. The mind was the brain, and the human mind brain, like those of other animals, came to have its current properties through a long process of evolution involving both physical and social environments. Through these sort of interactions with the physical and social environment, the lowly human-animal endowment came, uh, evolved and was changed in two fundamental ways. The organs of thought, which you actually think with, evolved, and the experiences of previous humans were passed on to their descendants either by some unknown process of social evolution. We don't quite know how one society passes on to their children um, their past customs, but through some unknown process of this, or by the inheritance of acquired characteristics through Lamarckian inheritance. If ancient ancestors learned to fear fire you know, because they got burned, then we would just start fearing fire without actually having to have any experience. If ancient ancestors got involved with incest and had all sorts of problems with incest, then current people would just fear incest automatically because they would inherit that experience. Okay. So that what you, what you had here was a general view about how to understand current human mentality, understand how the organs of thought evolved, and understand how social life, civilization evolved. Hence, it seemed both fruitful and necessary to approach the study of the mind-brain in two sort of complementary ways. Anatomy and physiology would fathom the current neural wiring and evolutionary biology, sociology, child psychology, anthropology, historical linguistics would trace the lengthy history of human mentality. Uh, given this dramatic agreement among the sciences and their potential to, for mutual enlightenment, that one of these guys can enlighten the other, it was, I think, natural for Freud to hope that a unified and tolerably complete story of the origins of human mentality could be told. You could actually go back and say, well, we started, you know, we were kind of these primitive crude guys, and then we learn from one thing after another, and we, we get more and more sophisticated, and then, you know, finally you can do the Phil Donahue show, right? Because you've got all these social accoutrements, and you can handle anything that comes up. I'm not quite sure that they would have believed that your ancient ancestors could have given you automatic answers to silly questions, but still, they gave you lots and lots of stuff, right? And so now, you know, you're this wonderfully sophisticated creature, and now we understand why human mentality works. I hope you can see that there was some sense to this project. I mean, human social life is very complicated, and it's not at all crazy to think that the way to understand it is by tracing it back from the origins to present day. 
However, the problem is this whole picture of agreement among the sciences all trooping along in the same direction, all mutually enlightening each other, all presenting this complete theory of human mentality, the problem is that this agreement among the sciences had a peculiar source. To see the issue clearly, let me just talk about a more limited set of disciplines than the eight that I showed you before. The agreement in approach among evolutionary sociology, evolutionary anthropology, and evolutionary biology was no accident. The former disciplines, sociology and anthropology, began with the assumption that the biological theory of evolution was correct and ought to be the benchmark for work in the social sciences. Further, even though historical linguistics predated both Lamarck and Darwin, like the theory of evolution itself, it was very much a product of 19th century historicism. All the theories in the 19th century were historical. This is actually one of the reasons why Darwin's theory of evolution caught on, because people expected that kind of explanation. How you understand something is you look at it historically, trace things back to its origins. That's not at all the way science is, conducting na is conducted now, so it seems strange to you, but it's not at all a crazy idea. Biological evolution then seemed attractive in part because it was a historical doctrine. When it emerged as a major scientific achievement, it reinforced the pre-existing historical predilections of contemporary theorists and also created a much tighter correspondence among the sciences, among the social and the biological sciences. Towards the end of the 19th century, different sciences appeared to be converging on a unified approach to the problem of mentality because they were all being guided by the same dominant intellectual force. Basic historicism dramatically invigorated by, and made specific is that their agreement, that they're all pointing in the same direction, doesn't matter for anything. You cannot assume, as Freud plainly did, that the fact that biology and sociology and anthropology all agree on what the problems were and on what the likely answers were you cannot assume that that means they're all right. Under these circumstances, agreements of the sci among the sciences could not be credited to their correct but independent depictions of a common reality. They all agreed, not because they were all giving you pictures of the same reality. They all agreed because they were all being led by the same intellectual force. Uh, understandably, Freud did not appreciate this point a devout evolutionist and system builder, when he, he looked for ways of integrating the disciplines, and when he found them, he did not ask about, he didn't recognize their common ancestry or question their source, but rather took the agreement among the disciplines as evidence that a unified theory of the mental was possible along basic evolutionary lines. Now, the quick moral here for cognitive science is that as the predominance of evolutionary explanations led Freud to believe that the time was ripe to integrate the different disciplines, so the proliferation of computational approaches is exactly what is driving cognitive science today. It's that all of these disciplines agree on computational approaches. It is that which has led to the uh, contemporary ideal of a unified cognitive science. Um, let me just skip here the story of the rise of computationalism. You had very important formal results in the 30s with Turing and Church. Then you actually built computers, and everyone could see that computers could solve incredibly difficult problems at great speed. What happened historically is that various disciplines then went over to a computational approach. First, psychology in the early 60s became computationalist. Then various other disciplines followed the same route. 30 years later, right now, uh, the proliferation of computational approaches in the mental sciences is as obvious as your nearest university catalog. I didn't look at Iowa State's catalog, but I'll tell you about UCSD's catalog. We offer courses in computational psychology, computational anthropology, computational linguistics, and computational neuroscience. I'm not making this up. I've taken this right out of the catalog. 
Now look, the parallel with psychoanalysis is obvious and painful. Freud was confident that a complete interdisciplinary theory of mind was within his grasp because he was fooled by the sort of spurious agreement of evidence produced by evolutionary historicism. All the sciences are agreeing, but they're not agreeing because they're all looking at the same reality. They're all agreeing because roughly they're all drinking at the same bars. Right? They're all agreeing on Darwinian evolutionary theories. And the problem is that's just what we're doing today, all right? that we all have the same intellectual heritage and we all do drink at the same bars. All right? And so the worry is that contemporary cognitive science, all of us in the cognitive science community are making exactly the same mistake. For the agreement in results and the agreement in approach is not a matter of independent sciences converging on a common reality, but of all of them sharing a common belief in computationalism. Even when you get fights within the cognitive science community, they're all basically assuming computationalism. Now, the danger in misreading a zeitgeist for a agreement among the sciences is not just an unseemly overconfidence that you now think, aha, we're ready. It's a lot worse than that. A dominant zeitgeist encourages an interdisciplinary approach because when there is substantial agreement among the disciplines about the important questions to ask and the range of acceptable answers, namely get a computational theory or get an origins type theory, then collaboration appears more fruitful. However, all right, so once you've got a zeitgeist going like this, then it looks like we should all work together because we're all, after all, working in the same direction. However, an interdisciplinary approach also lends to a greater commonality of beliefs and attitudes. We all work together, then we all, of course, come to share these beliefs all the more. Thus, the adoption of an interdisciplinary research strategy increases the strength of a zeitgeist, and which then furthers interdisciplinary integration and so forth. Okay. Right, the danger in adopting an interdisciplinary research strategy then, when you've got this tremendous commonality of view, when everybody already believes that computationalism is the way to go, is that you sacrifice important mechanisms for change. As work in related but independent disciplines can offer important confirmation, work in related but independent disciplines can also cast doubts on existing theories and offer hints about new approaches. The great danger in utilizing an interdisciplinary research strategy in the presence of a dominant zeitgeist is theoretical stagnation. Everybody's going to be doing exactly the same thing, and you've cut off all your sources of divergent views. Or if I can sort of put this in a way that computationalists might find more appealing, because I'll put it in their language, given a dominant zeitgeist, an interdisciplinary approach runs the risk of forcing research into a local minimum, if you're familiar with this, that you can't climb out of because you haven't got any sources of energy. All right, let me just briefly conclude. Look, given the negative tone of this paper, where I've been pointing out all the problems in interdisciplinary research, let me just conclude by saying that I believe in interdisciplinary research. I think that it is a fruitful way to approach these very, very complicated problems of understanding the mind. What I've tried to do, uh, both here and in, in the book I just wrote on Freud, is use Freud as an example so that we can sort of see the mistakes that an interdisciplinary research program gets into. The point is not to avoid interdisciplinary research, but to do it better. And that's what I want to use Freud for, to try to look at the mistakes he made, things like getting very excited about the agreement and the disciplines to think that, you know, just tomorrow we're going to get this right, that that's not true. There was another error I also skipped. I'm going to try to explain that. Um, and also this, this very dangerous thing of just saying, well, you know, everything's really going on fine in the other disciplines and they'll get it all worked out right, so I'm not going to worry about that. Um, I think the point of looking at Freud is not to discourage interdisciplinary research, but to try to do it in such a way that 
80 years from now or 100 years from now, people don't look back at interdisciplinary cognitive science and use that as the paradigm of a bad science or pseudoscience as Freud is used today. Okay, let me end there. Thank you.